All right. I think uh, we could start already. We have a nice group already assembled here. So if you didn't um, add your name, please add it to the agenda. I'll post it again in case you joined after I first posted it. Uh, so this is the um, second meeting of uh, June for the Special Oris Working Group. And um, today we got on the agenda Elemental. So I'm not sure who's going to do the introduction because it was like um, said the uh, uh, engineering team. <laughs> so I'm not sure who exactly gonna to to introduce next. Uh, but please go ahead. I think I can do this. So my name is Klaus Kempf, working uh, for SUSE, located in Nuremberg. And uh, with me is my colleague, David. Yes, I'm here. I hope you can hear me well. I'm David, um, software engineer, working for SUSE too, uh, obviously, and located in in Barcelona, Spain. So I will be presenting Elemental today or giving a quick introduction. David, can you start sharing the presentation? I can try. Let me see if it works. Otherwise, I can try to share. Oh, there it is. Oops. This. We can see it. Yeah, slideshow, I guess. Yes. Okay. So. All right. Today we are talking about Elemental. And uh, next slide. So let's talk about what is Elemental. Elemental is a software stack. And the purpose of the software stack is to make the operating system a first-class citizen in a cloud-native world. That means that everything appears to be cloud-native to a user um, of um, such an OS. And for the, uh, to achieve this, it is a lifecycle management layer. So we build um, the operating system Cloud natively, we um, install it and we update it and we sunset it. Everything um, controlled by um, Kubernetes means or standard cloud native tooling. Um, everything is based on standard Linux tools. So there's nothing special, um, you don't need a special distribution, of course, for an obvious reason, we focus on SUSE Linux, but um, what we do is all standard Linux software. And uh, because um, SUSE sells Rancher Manager, we of course have a Rancher extension to bring Elemental to the Rancher Management web UI so uh, people can manage their operating system layer um, through a web console. Next slide, please. Our design goals are important to understand some decisions we made in Elemental and uh, why we probably deviate from other um, similar solutions. So for foremost, the primary goal is to blend into cloud native operational practice. So we don't want um, customers who know Kubernetes or cloud native principles 
um, to learn something new. It should be treated, the operating system should be treated just like a workload. And so it starts with building OS um, images. We just use a normal uh, container workload building pipeline using Docker files uh, to create OS images um, and add or remove packages. Uh, very important to us is that we use an existing Linux distribution, that we don't try to reinvent the wheel, um, but build upon what we as SUSE offer, and that is um, our um, SUSE Linux enterprise distribution. Um, at the same time, it is important for our users that we don't add special infrastructure. Um, like for a normal Linux distribution, you would need a package re repository um, and, and so on. So um, with Elemental, everything is hosted in um, normal OCI registries and um, with Elemental, everything is represented as a Kubernetes resource and manageable with standard Kubernetes means. So um, you don't have to learn extra tooling. Um, you don't leave your uh, Kubernetes world. And um, if you want a nice UI, this is available through Rancher Manager where Elemental is an extension um, that can be added to an existing rancher management, uh, rancher manager deployment. Um, these are the engineering goals and they are guided by the user goals, which is the next slide. Um, so primary goal here and what we all, always get from our users is um, don't deviate from standard practices. Uh, don't add more com complexity to most of our um, users and, and customers. The operating system is just one layer in the, in the application stack. And ideally, they don't want to care about, like you don't care about the, the BIOS on your motherboard. Um, Elemental fills the gap between the managed and bare metal clusters. Our initial goal, of course, were bare, bare metal machines, but you could as well um, use it in um, virtualized environments or in, in, in public clouds. Um, so there is, there is no artificial um, bounder, boundary limiting the usage. What we always get as a feedback from users is they want reproducibility and predictability. Um, they are um, tired of package dependency conflicts and, and so on. They really want uh, to roll out one image to many, many uh, nodes and exactly um, define what is running on their Kubernetes nodes. For this, um, Elemental makes the OS layer declarative, immutable, and sec secure, especially by minimizing um, the number of packages that are, that are needed. Um, we don't have any open ports re required. Uh, so um, the attack surface is almost zero. And what we all always get also from customers is um, they are looking for a supported and certified stack from top to, to, to bottom. Um, so inheriting certifications, for example, from SUSE Linux Enterprise is an important selling uh, point here um, to not uh, create a separate OS, but build upon an established OS. 
And now I hand over to David for the more technical details. Thank you, Klaus. All right, uh, so the elemental uh, project as a whole can be divided mostly into aspects, into areas. We could consider it something like the server side and the client side components. So in, in the server side components, what we have is what we call the elemental operator, which is in fact a Kubernetes operator, is the Kubernetes operator that is responsible of uh, orchestrating and preparing uh, all the OS management layer from Kubernetes. So it's the responsible of handling node registration, rolling out uh, OS bootstrapping, and also triggering Kubernetes provisioning to nodes and managing OS upgrades through Kubernetes from OCI images. So that's the scope of uh, the elemental operator is basically the Kubernetes controller side of things. And then we have what we call the elemental toolkit. And the Elemental Toolkit is a set of utilities to actually build uh, what we call Elemental Enabled OSs uh, as a thin layer of software. So basically, the Elemental Toolkit is just a small piece of software we put on top of a generic Linux OS. So it allows us to manipulate it and treat it in the way we want, as basically as some sort of a container thing. So we like to treat the OS as a stateless blob as we would with OCI containers. So for the sake or for, for the purpose of this meeting, we're mostly focusing on the elemental toolkit as we understand this is what might be in the interest of this working group. So first, let me iterate or reinforce a bit uh, what Klaus already introduced. So I'd like to uh, make clear or try to dip a bit uh, deeper on what is and what is not the Elemental Toolkit. We want to make clear that this is not a Linux distribution. So we are not trying to reinvent the wheel here, ne neither provide something new on that regard. We are just uh, providing a set of tools to craft OS images according to our needs. We also do not pretend to be special Linux OS. Probably this is a bit uh, surprising here in this special purpose OS working group, but we really try not to be special. We try to be as less opinionated as possible. And indeed also uh, Elemental Toolkit is not coupled to Kubernetes in any way, neither coupled to any specific Linux distro. It's just a set of tools stack to actually craft and prepare uh, an OS image as an OCI container. And as Klaus already introduced, for obvious reasons, the Elemental Toolkit is basically what we used uh, to provide or to build uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise microimages. So I think it, it was already presented uh, in this working group a few months ago from by Richard Brown, I think, the open SUSE micro OS distribution. Mm -hmm. So we are basically basic or based on top of these, uh, or the commercial offering mm -hmm. of this uh, OS. So, what is actually the Elemental Toolkit? The Elemental Toolkit is actually delivered and provided as a, as a Golang binary, so we call the Elemental Client. And this uh, utility, what basically provides is a set of commands to actually operate with uh, OS container images. It is capable to install images to disk or to a system is capable to upgrade an already running system with a new image to reset it to so it can go back uh, to a known uh, state as a clean as it was a clean install mm -hmm. and it also provides utilities to mm -hmm. uh, to build what we call the installation media it's capable to uh, mm -hmm. from an OS container is capable to build an ISO image or a raw disk image, so it can be directly deployed or uh, put it in, in bare metal machines. As a, an important note, since we are always focusing or considering the Kubernetes context, none of these uh, build uh, commands or procedures 
is actually requiring special permits, so it can it can be used or it, it can be we can actually build. Uh, oh, sorry, there is a phone here. Hold on. Our, sorry for that. So the build eyes or the build these commands are not requiring any special permit, so they can actually run inside the regular uh, Kubernetes pod. So we can use even Kubernetes to build an OS image, an installation media with all the needs you need, we need. Moreover, the elemental uh, toolkit binary is also providing uh, a small subset of, or a small set of embedded OS configurations. Basically, it's containing uh, the configuration for Grab2 for the bootloader. It's also configura uh, including the, conf the configuration for the immutability layer. So the, the Dracat module, uh, we use Dracat for building init.id. So it uses the Dracat module that actually sets uh, the immutable layout at boot time. And it also includes a set of uh, systemd unit files. So basically, uh, these three tools or those three common Linux uh, tools that are marked here in bold, the group tool, Dracat, and systemd, this is actually our expectation from a Linux OS. So these are the critical dependencies that Elemental has uh, over the OS. So we assume there's going to be grub uh, as a bootloader. We assume we're going to use Dracat for building the init ID. And we assume that services and uh, boot process is going to be managed by systemd. So again, as saying before, we are not trying to be very opinionated on that. Those are common tools that you can find in most uh, Linux distributions. So we, we try to stay as less opinionated as possible. Moreover, and finally, this, uh, Embedded toolkit binary also includes few uh, basic uh, cloud config configurations. By cloud config configurations, we understand that we include some declarative uh, YAML uh, configuration files. So, what is uh, how is Elemental providing OS upgrades? It's using OS image upgrades. So, basically, during an OS upgrade, what Elemental does is essentially dropping in a new full OS image. And for that purpose, it kind of uses some sort of AB partitioning scheme. So in, in that case, uh, there is what we call the state partition. There is a state partition, including all OS images that are installed in that system. There is only one OS image that's active, and it's the default one to boot from. And there is a configurable number of old fallback images. So in the, in the upgrade procedure, Elemental, what basically does is includes a new OS image in the state partition. It uh, marks it as the default. So on reboot, it will actually boot from the new OS image and include the old one in case something fails, there is an automatic fallback. So this is uh, probably you remember from that, but this is basically the same uh, kind of procedure that comes from transactional updates from uh, from Slim Micro. So this this automatic fallback is that using Grub to fallback, or where is the fallback built? All right, so it's it's in two areas. So there is a Grub fallback in case it fails before getting into the kernel and init ID. And uh, in case uh, there is uh, a failure uh, during the boot or in later stages at boot, there is uh, some grab variables that are counting. So let's say different. There is a variable that marking the boot as an upgrade in case uh, it reaches uh, to a healthy state, which is configurable by, by uh, a bunch of health checks that user can provide. So if it passes the health check, we clear that grab variable and that's it, we are done. And if we don't pass this health check, we basically reboot. So that's that's in very quickly how how this is set. It it uses basically the same approach as the Slim Micro. 
So again, we're, we're not providing a new technology on that regard. We use what we just use what the underlying distribution provides us. And reinforcing that, uh, we also support uh, the OS images. We consider OS images to be snapshots, and we currently support uh, two different types of snapshotting if you want. So we basically can use ButterFS subvolumes. So in our state partition, what we have is a collection of uh, ButterFS subvolumes where each subvolume is the root tree of an OCI image. Or we can eventually also support uh, file system images. Imagine something like a bunch of uh, SquashFS file system images. So regarding the immutability, we, we consider Elemental to, to be an immutable Linux because uh, we basically, what we do is to roll out to the uh, system uh, an OS image, a root tree that is mounted in read-only mode. And during the initial uh, init RAMFS stage, we set up specifically which are the paths we want to be readable or we want or we require to be readable. So for instance, we divide paths into ephemeral and persistent. So ephemeral paths are just paths mounted uh, on top of uh, an overlay FS where the upper file system is a temp FS. So it's, it's happening on run. So every reboot this is going to be gone. So all the changes you make into the ephemeral paths in this case, example here, it's under ETC and server, all the changes you do at runtime uh, in those paths are going to be dropped on any boot or every reboot. And we also have some persistent paths uh, where we want to also keep them across reboots. They are stored uh, in an overlay of S2, but on a upper file system that is happening or that is stored in a devoted persistent partition. So in this case, we, for instance, we store systemd uh, unit files. We store some branch metadata and other, other parts we may need like home, uh, root, or user local. So all the rest, it's just retold it. This is just a, a runtime uh, layer that is mounted on top of the, the read only root file system. This is applied in, in RAMFS, and this dynamically creates and populates uh, the FSTAP file accordingly. So it, as soon as it reaches root, uh, system D continues from there as a, any regular distribution. And as from a user perspective, you, you have like a declarative or a, a very clear, specific uh, layout setup visible at the standard location like is FSTOP. So how it is to build uh, an OS image with Elemental? As we said before, we try to make everything closer as possible as uh, the experience uh, one may have building container workloads. So we basically aim to build the OS as a regular OCI container. And for that, we require essentially four simple steps. First is, of course, in order to make an OS container bootable, it has to include the essentials. So it has to include kernel, systemd, Zercat, the bootloader, etc. So you have to install uh, these uh, tools or these packages into the container, you have to install the, oh, sorry, I have to go back. No, slideshow, sorry for that. Apparently going back, goes back in browser history. All right. So you have to install also the Elemental client. The Elemental client is going to be, as said before, is the responsible of operating uh, these container images. So it's going to be responsible to run uh, the installation and run upgrades. Then the third stage is you might want uh, to configure the system according to your needs. So that's where you would actually enable the services you want to be enabled by default, 
or you would include here additional software like proprietary drivers or something like that, or even include some static configuration you know is going to be there every time. And finally, last step, you run the elemental init command, which is a subcommand from the elemental client. And this command basically what's going to do is simply drop a few files into the root tree. Those are the grab configuration. This is the drag out configuration to build the init OD and few other details like uh, some systemd unit files uh, to hook uh, cloud configuration to certain stages. And this will also build, rebuild again, automatically the init OD. So the init OD is, is going to already include the elemental client itself and is also going to include the layout uh, configuration for the immutability, uh, for the immutability uh, feature. And basically, this is as simple as that. As saying before, this is an absolutely 100% valid Docker file that provides an, an elemental enabled OS based on open SUSE tumbleweed. It basically installs the essential packages. It's kernel, drag out some, uh, some drivers like device mapper and some other utilities for file systems and partitioning, but nothing special in here. Second, we install the elemental client. We use here like a uh, wget and you could eventually just uh, wget the, the binary uh, from somewhere. As I said before, uh, this is just a Golang binary. So it's not something difficult to deploy or to install. Of course, as SUSE, we provide uh, an RPM for the elemental client. But if you, are, you happen to be in a non-RPM based distribution, you just need to include and drop uh, the binary into a regular location like you have been in your path. Then you could eventually enable essential services. In this case, as in, for exemplifying purposes, we're enabling network manager. And we also do some uh, OS release file decorations just for to keep track of what we're building. We consider that a good practice. And finally, we run the elemental init uh, command. This elemental in command will simply drop a uh, bootloader configuration, drag out configuration, and rebuild in its OD, and we're ready to go. This is a container that's ready uh, to be installed uh, and booted as an elemental enabled OS. So, what's next? So, then again, is where the, the client comes into play. So you could eventually uh, convert it into a bootable media by assuming we just pushed the new created image to a registry. We make elemental build ISO and uh, uh, image URI. And this is going to compute uh, an ISO that's bootable, including a squashfs image with the root tree of that container. And again, We'd like to reinforce that this build ISO command can be easily executed inside uh, a regular container, does not require privileges. So you could eventually run this in a, in a Kubernetes environment as a bot. Then we, we could actually use that new uh, created ISO to install it or to boot it and install the image into a disk. So the elemental install command, again, you can just paste it or pass to it uh, a registry image or a registry reference and will download and expand that and install this into a, a given disk. Or from a running system, you can simply just elemental upgrade and just include the reference of the image you want to upgrade to. So the idea is that we treat the DOS as a, a full stateless blob in a similar way as we do with containers. The idea is that uh, we can eventually build and create DOS 
uh, system in a similar way as we would with a container or a workload container. We just iteratively uh, prepare and craft uh, the image. And once we are done, this is uh, predictable and easy to reproduce. And with that, that's mostly all I had for now. I did, uh, I probably went a bit fast. We did kind of a small uh, introduction aiming or giving room for questions or to have an open conversation, if that makes sense. Thank you for the presentation. So if anyone got questions. How dependent the build system is uh, on architecture, actually. Uh, so for example, let's say I want to build that for RM, um, ARM, a CPU. Uh, does it just simply support anything or do I need to have some special configuration? Not entirely sure I follow the purpose of the question, but anyway, what we are what we are supporting is what the underlying distribution supports. So, for instance, uh, Sleep Micro supports ARM, so we are also supporting ARM. But I'm not sure if you are asking for something like uh, cross architecture building. Yeah, uh, I was uh, asking for the cross cross building. For example, let's say right. I am running um, the machine. Uh, with uh, Intel CPU and want to build uh, ARM image of, let's say, Ubuntu. Right. So this is a bit tricky. So it, it comes with constraints. So for instance, we can, from a given ARM image, we could eventually build an ISO. And this ISO could be built in an x86 system. So I could imagine having an upstream uh, x86 uh, Kubernetes cluster, where I use it to build, as an example, uh, Raspberry Pi ISOs or Raspberry Pi raw disks. Mm -hmm. Imagining that the OS container for that Raspberry Pi, I already have it, or I already have it in a registry, or I created somewhere else. Then how to actually uh, create uh, such, such an ARM-based OS image in a non-ARM system, that is exactly the same as it would with any other container. So we are not different on that. We are not doing anything special in that. So for the building of the, the OS container, we do not uh, require any special tooling. So you can use Docker build, you can use Spotman build, you can use Kiwi, for instance, as uh, the client builder, you can use the mean whatever you want. As long as the result is an OCI image, this is fine. Thank you very Did much. You okay. And maybe clarification on sort of what, what immutable means here. It means that, you know, I can customize, I take some base OS image and then I can customize it based on whatever packages I want, whatever. And then I tell Elemental to build one that's unique to me on my needs. And then immutable means that as the power goes in and out, as I reboot it 17 times, it, the, nothing changes on the actual disk. Is that what immutable means? Or? All right, going back uh, to that slide. So immutable for us means that the, the root tree that's part of the uh, OS container is always mounted as read-only. And it even can be configured if you are really, really uh, in the need of having strictly strict immutability, you could even uh, build or install these as a squashy fast image. So this is definitely going to be immutable. And on top of that, because any system requires some areas to be readable, on top of that, we can configure at your own needs some specific paths that are going to be readable. And it can be readable in two different forms. It can be ephemeral, what we call ephemeral is that it's going to be all the changes in using overlay effects are going to be stored in RAM. So they are going to be dropped for every reboot. 
or you could store them into a, a persistent partition. And that's the thing is that this is configurable. So it is, is up uh, to your specific needs, what you want. So of course, uh, in this example, configuration file we have here, uh, we could include uh, almost every directory in, in, the, in the tree. And that would, of course, compromise the concept of immutability. But that's up to your choice. So that's that's a bit the the idea of elemental. And again, we're trying not to be that much opinionated. But but it means sure. what sort of the minimum set do you have to have? Well, things being ephemeral means that what you're actually running with, right? It clearly can be completely different. Like if you mark all of slash Etsy as ephemeral, well, sure, what's stored on the disk is the same. But if the device gets compromised, well, you have no idea what lives in Etsy, right? Um, so, so it, it, it's an, I understand what a read-only root file system means. And I thought that, that um, immutable was something in, above that, but it does, sounds like it could just be a read-only root file system. I don't know right, if you so, agree with that terminology, but, but that's sort of the way I think about it. I see, I see. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it's, this is how, how we actually envision And by, by immutable, uh, that, that's what we mean. So the, the file system or the, the, the OS is basically equivalent on every boot. And we try uh, to keep uh, as much as possible on the ephemeral side. So we can we consider that uh, there has been no changes across reboots. So let's, let's see it this way, for instance. And there is no there is, let's say, there is no expected way to modify it on runtime. And of course, uh, you could figure out strategies and ways to do stuff. But, but the idea is that if you make your homework, you keep that minimal, that's going to have a very, very small surface uh, where you can actually apply changes. OK, thanks. So if, if I understand the architecture right, then you're, you're basically using any um, user provided or user chosen Linux distro as the, the user space. But you're shipping your own kernel, or do you kind of recover the kernel um, for the distro you're using, and then somehow work that into the whole system as well. Okay, I'm going to uh, let's say different. For obvious reasons, since we are SUSE employees, what we are actually supporting is SUSE uh, Linux Enterprise. That's clear. Uh, the example here, this is in this example, it's open to the table width. Mm -hmm. But we also have in the same Elemental Toolkit repository examples for Ubuntu and Fedora. Right? And we use whatever the distro provides in those cases. And obviously, this is something that we, as we are not supporting. However, we keep uh, this, uh, let's say, we keep testing and validating this approach by means of being sure we keep being distro agnostic and we keep being not really opinionated. So we try not to, let's say, get into the what a distro would be a world. So we, we, we try not to provide our own Linux here. Uh, it, that, that makes sense to me. I, I was just thinking because you base this on a, on a Docker file and you're basically uh, using the user space docker image of any given distro and you import that and then i mean how how do you and then basically you from from the distro docker image you build your operating system image right which then right. boots on a node now the the kind of the gap that i have in my in my mind <laughs> the thing that's missing is like how do you how do you uh, uh, create uh, the 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 kernel and any rd and all, all that initial boot logic is that something that you take from the respective distros as well via the Docker image during we, the image build, or? We take it from the respective distro. So yeah, you can see yeah. here, we are installing the kernel that the distro provides. If that would be another distro that 
probably would be called slightly different, but there's the kernel. And then here, there is this is where the magic happens. So this uh, elemental init command, basically what basically does is drops in few text files, configuration mm -hmm. text files, and that those include, in essence, an, a Dracat module for initRD, which is basically setting some uh, unit files to to honor this configuration here, mm -hmm. right? And and basically after that, it creates a new initRD by just calling Dracat with no special thing. So it, it's basically just, uh, let's say, we could call it some syntax sugar if you want. So you just to ease the, the process of building uh, an elemental valid in it already. Oh, okay, got it, got it. it did, exactly, so, that, that was my missing bit. Thank you, I, I get it now, that makes a lot of sense. Right, and yeah. Also, so, you, you, you created a nice connection for me in my head between the, the configuration, because that was my next question and you answered it. Um, the, the configuration basically rendering all of the configuration details and at which point do they actually apply? Uh, and um, it appears to me from your, your explanation that this is at, um, at image build time. Some of it is at real image time, but uh, some of, so only the things that you know are going to be static are image build time. So mm -hmm. let's go roll back a little. As I said before, there are two uh, areas in Elemental project. There's the Elemental operator. We did not talk uh, about this in this call because we kind of thought that this was not in the interest of it. But uh, the operator is, let's say, the server side of things, the, the Kubernetes mm -hmm. controller. This Kubernetes controller is the responsible of setting the node registration with an, an upper uh, Kubernetes cluster. And in this process, there is an information exchange, and there is where you provide your declarative cloud configuration to the downstream node. So in this very first initial communication, it fetches uh, the cloud configuration you declared in your Kubernetes resource, and then it gets applied during the installation if needed, or at first boot, depending exactly on, on, on what, uh, what are you doing. Awesome. Yeah, makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Kilo, to address your questions about image building, we have in our GitHub repository um, other um, Docker samples file where we, of course, need to start from a distro specific uh, build environment so that we have a package manager. But then we install into um, a subdirectory and then we copy the content of this subdirectory to a scratch container mm -hmm. so that we fully control what is inside the target image. Um, there is no, uh, there are no artifacts from, um, from the built environment. Cool. I see Dimitris has a hands up. Hi, David. Um, uh, I, I think Klaus mentioned that there is an integration with uh, Rancher. So fr from what I've seen, I can't see where a, a GUI is needed. So what does that provide? What, what does it mean uh, it has integration? So what do you get from the GUI? So basically, what you get from the, the UI is uh, a manager of the the Kubernetes resources that are actually uh, driving the life cycle of it. So ah, that's the other slide. So you said you'll focus on the toolkit. OK, so correct, the yes. there is the elemental operator. The elemental operator is a Kubernetes controller that uh, talks with the Rancher uh, UI extension. And it basically provides from a UI perspective, it provides uh, yeah, some steps to actually create the registration endpoints. So nodes can register to the upstream cluster from a given token. And once there is a, a node registration, a node reg, a no, a registration endpoint, sorry, uh, you, we can create uh, from the upstream uh, cluster, we can create the, the ISOs to be booted 
uh, and registered against that registration endpoint. So we kind of couple or we kind of create uh, an ISO that's including or preloading uh, these uh, registration URLs. So as soon as you boot it, it will be capable to contact, to call home and register itself. And from there, as I said before, during the registration, there is an exchange of uh, cloud configuration. And there is where you could define uh, other details like the users, if anyone's needed, passwords, SSH keys, if you, in case you want SSH enabled, we don't require it, but if, if you want it, you just install it and provide SSH keys, these sort of things. So, so the resource the operator is acting on describes the final OS and it's getting built in Kubernetes yeah. or is that manages the manages the operator is a controller it's a Kubernetes controller that's actually managing the life cycle of uh, the nodes. So okay. from the operator you could orchestrate via Kubernetes resource uh, an upgrade on no, the okay. nodes. Okay. So you say, uh, this is my managed OS image. I define the, the OCI image reference from a registry. I want to roll out two nodes. And this is going to create, uh, in this case, uh, we are using a fleet. And this is going to, to use fleet to actually roll to downstream clusters, plans to actually apply mm -hmm. uh, yeah, an upgrade. So it all goes, this is the part of getting the OS managed uh, from a central point from Kubernetes itself. Oh, nice, awesome, thanks. So for that OS bootstrap, is there, does that support bare metal, VMs? What, how, what are the supported environments for that? So uh, as uh, Klaus, I think I kind of mentioned in the beginning, we are not restricted on that and we support whatever the underlying distribution supports. So this makes sense in uh, virtualized environments and in bare metal, and it could eventually make sense in, in public cloud too, even that's probably not the most obvious use case for this. But, but how do you, what, what is the process to actually do that OS bootstrap? It's you, if you're doing bare metal, I'm assuming there's got to be some communication so, with BMC. Correct. So the, boot or... exactly. So the, the bootstrapping procedure is basically we create an installation media. Uh, most commonly imagined, we create an ISO that includes the registration URL to call uh, the, the management cluster. It boots, it registers itself using this uh, registration URL. And from, from that point, it fetches from the upstream cluster the cloud configuration and kickstarts the installation of the OS. So you, you would include in that cloud configuration the, some details on how you want to install the OS. And from there, the process goes on. Not sure if that... Makes so there's some here. process that loads a, a live image that then pulls down. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So the ISO is a live image that that boots, and this live image can be used to install itself. So the self content of the live live image is installed to the system, or it could be even used just to kickstart the installation of a remote image from a registry. Okay. That's, Thanks. That's configurable. Are there any further questions? Um, so actually I need to drop in a couple of minutes so I'll leave the hosting of the meeting for Sean. Uh, but the next speaker would be Tilo if there are no further questions. I'll, I'll make it quick. Actually, it's it's great to see that kind of traction and interest uh, in, um, in Elemental. It's great to have you Fox here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll be quick. So we had a uh, great um, panel discussion at uh, at KubeCon EU in Paris, and um, there was basically several uh, operating uh, special purpose operating system folks joining there. Uh, we had a, we had a slide deck, um, brainstormed and set up so to walk people um, through kind of what we're doing. 
and then I think we came to the second or third slide, and then we basically opened um, things up to the to the audience, which was planned, right? But we never got back to the slide deck. Like we had a very um, awesome and fruitful discussion with members of the audience. Uh, they gave great feedback. They had great questions, and now we're gonna do the same thing again, which will be at um, the Open Source Summit in uh, Vienna. We have a panel with the uh container con sub conference and uh, we have a slightly um uh updated uh set of panelists and that's because um we're i think eight or nine special purpose operating systems in this group so uh and the, the panel has four seats right <laughs> so we need to rotate a little so everybody gets their turn um, usually other folks join via the audience. I won't be on the panel. I'll just holding the mic um, and then getting the audience involved. So even if you're not a panelist, uh, you absolutely should join and uh, take part in the decision, in the, in the discussion. Um, I will share the link to the document in, uh, in this chat. It's also linked from our agenda. So it's relatively easy to find. Um, and uh, so this is... Um, in, in, in this instance of the panel in, in Vienna, we will have uh, Eric um, representing Eve. And that is awesome because the first time we met Eric, that was on our KubeCon uh, panel in Paris. And that's how we kind of drew Eric into this into this group. So now he's going to be on the panel uh, in Vienna. We have Richard Brown joining from, from uh, Suzu Micro OS. We have Mauro Morales representing Keros. And Filippo Ichi for Unicraft. Um, I think is, this is as, as special purpose as it gets. Um, basically, a super a super lean micro uh, kernel. I will be in the audience, um, probably moderating, holding the mic, not representing Flatcar because uh, Danielle will be on the on the panel and representing Flatcar. So if any of uh, of the other folks want to join, um, I don't know. Uh, how uh, uh, David's and Klaus's uh, travel plans are in September, but Vienna is nice in September. Maybe maybe we just meet. Um, if you're around, uh, you absolutely you, you can get your own slide. You'll be mentioned on the panel and basically can get involved in the discussion if you're interested. And of course, any other representative of any other special purpose operating system is open to join that forum and the discussion. So, so you said that the, <clears throat> the slides you didn't get to present in Paris, are those uh, linked from the agenda as well? So sort of getting background on the scope that you were thinking you would cover in all yeah, that it, panel. So basically, yeah, the, the slides are also, so it's, it's a link chain. Um, the, um, uh, the panel proposal is linked from the from our agenda. And in the panel proposal, you'll find links to the slides. Um, uh, the, the, slides okay. don't, the, the slides don't really have an agenda. They were they were mostly meant as conversation starters, and like the most content um, in in quotes is actually in the last three slides, which are not officially part of the of the um, the presentation. And those I just had uh, in order, you know, to to start a discussion um, across the panelists. But that wasn't necessary at all because we got so much interest and so much traction from the audience. Um, so it was relatively the, the the panel was relatively late on the last day of the conference. That's a bad spot to have. But I mean, the I think the room was uh, seventy five percent, eighty percent full. Um, so people were really interested in this stuff. So that was exciting. But it might make sense to yeah, figure out are there sort of interesting teasers to put in the initial slides to to wake up people and you know sort of engage in the debate later, right? Exactly, and that's um, that's what that that's what the the conversation um, starter slides were about. But we we didn't need them. Like the input we got from the audience was actually better than what we ourselves could dream up, um, and that's. Uh, I mean, we still have the they, they still all of those conversation starters are still valid. And they can fill probably hours of discussion. Um, if uh, folks have any input to that, just feel free to just you know um, put it in the slide deck as well. Usually before the actual event at the conference, um, we're we're meeting uh, and brainstorming a little bit, so we'll probably update the slides. But yeah, um, it's a it, it's it's been a pretty loose structure, and the whole event benefited from that. 
Oh, we're I think we're yeah. we're now merging into the tag runtime meeting. <laughs> this, is a, <laughs> this is a nice way to, you know, um hand over the 